Welcome to our second panel for this morning, um, which will be our panel on the information economy. My name is Martha Poon. I am a researcher at the, uh, a new research institute called Data and Society, and I will be chairing this morning. I thought I would open with just a quick um, hint of history uh, before introducing you to our distinguished panelists. So as we all know, information and information, history, uh, information technology is evolving, and it's evolving very quickly. We now have been in the information age long enough to recognize that information society will not be a one-step transition. So in the late 1960s, as some of you may have seen, Jim Henson produced a short advertising film for IBM that was called The Paperwork Explosion. And it decried the boring and repetitive nature of business correspondence. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you uh, find it on YouTube. It's an excellent little film. The ad was for a machine that was called a magnetic tape selectric typewriter, which Professor Dugan has just told me he used to write his master's thesis. And it was the first device to provide word processing capability. The central message of the ad is really interesting to look back when we look back from today. Uh, the ad said machines should work, people should think. A lot has changed in the intervening years. So the first is that information machines crept out of the back offices of businesses and of industry. They moved onto our desktops, both in the office and at home. Then they slid onto our laps, they got screens, they connected to the internet, and now they're sliding onto our wrists, they're slipping into our pockets, they're kicking around at the bottom of our purses. And we are perpetually encouraged to buy into a variety of personal devices today, like smart watches, smartphones, tablets, the chip cards you'll soon be getting from Visa and MasterCard, that is also smart technology, and the Fitbits that many of our distinguished panelists yesterday were wearing, if you looked closely. We are also uh, told to look forward to a future that will be filled with things like smart cars that will drive us through these places called smart cities. So it seems that the technologists who imagine, design, and manufacture information machines are no longer interested in doing and taking care of the boring and repetitive work. There is definitely an ambition now to fill the world with a network of distributed and connected machinery that is smart, and it's going to do the thinking. So we are now poised on the edge of a technological moment, a moment within the information society that will be defined by what computer scientists call machine learning. The question of our panel, and perhaps it's the question from our panel to our colleagues in the profession of economics, is this. Is economics aware of the changing three-dimensional architecture of computing-based systems? Is economic thought keeping pace with information engineering. And to echo a question we heard yesterday, does the existence of new information infrastructure affect economic theories? We are joined today by three very distinguished panelists, none of whom are economics, economists, but all of whom have expertise in the field of information technology. Our very first speaker will be Shoshana Zuboff. She's Professor Emeritus at Harvard Business School. She is best known for her groundbreaking work on the effects of digital automation on workers in places like paper mills and processing plants in the late 1970s and early 1980s. But today she will speak about yet another technological transformation of equal significance that is currently underway. Our second speaker is Paul Dugan. He joins us from the School of Information from uh, University of Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And he is the co-author of The Social Life of Things with John Seeley Brown. He is here to enrich our perspective on the quality and nature of information produced by these new technical systems. And last but not least, we will hear from our kind and thoughtful host, Simon Head. Simon has been investigating the condition of people, workers, in global corporations whose labor is increasingly being managed by computer-centered managerial systems. And Simon's latest book was entitled Mindless, Why Smart Machines Are Making Humans Dumber. We've all heard the expression that time is money. Um, in the information world, we also know that time is information. I trust that our panelists will use their time wisely to inform you as best they can. And then we will open it up to the floor and um, take your questions. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you for listening. Thank you. 
you, Martha. That was such a great uh, framing of our, of our session. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be here uh, with all of you today, this bleary Sunday, and uh, part of such an auspicious group as this conference represents. As in all conversations of this sort, we must begin with Sir Isaac Newton, who, in legend, watched the apple fall from the tree. But what he actually saw was something quite different. What he saw was an invisible force powerful enough to draw the apple to it. <clears throat> now, had he lived in Silicon Valley, wow, look at that cool apple. <laughs> he might have developed an algorithm to predict its motion. Had he been an economist, he might have fixated on how to model the efficiency of the apple's earthbound path. Instead, he endured accusations of medievalism and sophistry to assert the theory of universal gravitation, identifying an unseen force able to exert its power over hundreds of millions of miles, a force that summons the tides, fixes the paths of the stars, and binds the entire cosmos. In this sense, the conventional narrative of modern capitalism is pre-Newtonian. It migrates from small-scale merchant trade to seagoing fleets to small concentrations of volume production to the corporation and mass production to global financial instruments and digital networks Economic history enshrines these supply-side stars in capitalism's firmament, but never does it ask what holds them all in place. The young Durkheim, I hate conferences where people quote Durkheim, but you're gonna like this one. <laughs> the young Durkheim, who would have loved to be a part of this conference, answers this precise question when he proposes the social equivalent of Newton's invisible force field. He asserts that both civilization and the division of labor are effects of the same cause. What is that cause? I quote, the division of labor appears to us otherwise than it does to economists. For them, it essentially consists in greater production. I think we heard that yesterday. For us, this greater productivity is only a necessary consequence, a repercussion of the phenomenon. If we specialize, it is not to produce more, but to enable us to live in the new conditions of existence that have been made for us. The changing profile of human needs is the social incarnation of gravitational pull that summons technology, markets, market forms, the division of labor, and ultimately civilization itself. From this point of view, the point of view of the social, successful market forms enable the greatest number of people to achieve effective life as determined by the conditions of existence in their place and their time. This is the ontological origin of what economists call supply and demand. It says that these are linked effects of the same cause, human need. The economics of the last 30 years as we heard a great deal about yesterday, radically lifted the market form out of the social and severed supply and demand from these shared roots. This produced what I view as the existential contradiction of our times. On the one hand, the long arc of the 20th century turned us into individuals defined by a sense of psychological self-determination and sovereignty, unknown to prior generations. We seek to create effective life on our own terms in every domain. On the other hand, we are confronted by a capitalism stripped down to its raw core, 
It drifts from our needs as it shrinks to the narrow disciplines of shareholder value maximization and its financial metrics. We are trained in powerlessness as firms disappear behind robotized interfaces, indifferent to individual subjectivity. We must exercise control over our own lives, but everywhere that control is thwarted. We feel that our lives have value, but too often we are treated as expendable. The theme is one of thwarted effectiveness. Another dimension of the grotesque consequences of income inequality are these substantial inequalities of effective life. This is the legacy with which we have entered the 21st century. And in our frustration and our needs for self-determination, we summoned the internet into our daily lives as an emancipatory, empowering, alternative domain where we rush to find new resources for effective life. People, ideas, mobilizations, information, autonomy, freedom, creativity. In less than two decades after the Mosaic web browser was released to the public, enabling easy access to the World Wide Web, a 2010 BBC poll found that 79, 79% of people in 26 countries considered internet access to be a fundamental human right. As we charged ahead to claim these network spaces, the milieu of capital shifted too, from atoms to bits. Firms now operate both in and as networked information <coughs> flows. But the question of information capitalism has been a black box, largely invisible to economists. There's been a general kind of gloss in which information plus capitalism equals information capitalism. If we have time during the discussion, we can talk a little bit more about how that's happened, but that's essentially the case. Now, I look at the problem differently. Capitalism's success in the long durée has depended upon the emergence of new market forms that respond to new populations, each with its own internal logic and distinct legal and institutional expressions. Some rise to hegemony, others exist in parallel to the dominant form, and others are revealed in time as evolutionary dead ends, capitalism's toothed birds. So here is the question that I'm posing. Will new forms of capitalism develop in the networked sphere? And by that I mean new market forms that are unimaginable outside the connected digital computational milieu of the internet and its successors in interest. I mean new forms that express fundamentally new means as well as fundamentally new ends. And if so, Will these new forms genuinely address our needs for effective life, reuniting supply and demand? Everything is at stake here. Just as industrial capitalism shaped the nature of industrial civilization, the dominant form or forms that emerge in the networked sphere will shape the character of what I'm calling information civilization in our century. In my new work, I examine two theoretically distinct, but in practice increasingly commingled, networked market forms that I call advocacy capitalism and surveillance capitalism. These now vie for hegemony in the network sphere. Each implies a new social contract, new social relations, and therefore new politics. An efficient way to characterize these forms is that advocacy capitalism realizes economic value by meeting new needs produced by thwarted effectiveness. Surveillance capitalism realizes economic value by exploiting 
those very same needs. Each draws upon the unique affordances of the networked digital milieu, and each is unimaginable in an analog world. Not only is each form contested and internally conflicted, but the boundary between them has become a zone of significant conflict. Now, just a very quick taste of some themes. All we can do in our time is the tapas version of a bigger meal. Advocacy capitalism rose to fix the broken systems of the 20th century and to address individuals in their felt needs. It draws its name from a fundamental reorientation, what I call an inversion around the individual and consumer. The iPod iTunes complex as first developed is an illustration. The end consumer identifies valued assets, songs. These are digitized and rescued from legacy structures, CDs, which are then bypassed to, dis to distribute these assets directly to the individual in the context of support platforms that enable dynamic individual reconfiguration. The result is radical affordability and people who get what they want, when they want it, where they want it, how they want it. The form has been applied primarily to digital goods and is only beginning to be explored with combinations of digital, physical, and human assets. Now, this is crucially important because in my view, this is the path toward the radical reconfiguration of the two most important and intransigent sectors of our economy, health and education. And I'm not gonna go into the details of that case, but I'm hoping that during our discussion we'll be able to talk that a little bit. However, advocacy capitalists have been slow to institutionalize a new social contract. And this has become an Achilles heel, leaving them vulnerable to further mutation that has taken the form in new directions, namely toward a surveillance model. Right now, surveillance capitalism is becoming the default option for many internet businesses as more firms, startups, applications developers, and investors mobilize around this one plausible version of information capitalism. It's growing rapidly because its major actors grasp the emergent rules and meanings of their path-breaking logic more crisply and more decisively than others, including us. They have not hesitated to drive its systemic coherence at an extremely high velocity that no one can follow. Take, for example, Google. Now, Google is both the pioneer and the most advanced practitioner of surveillance capitalism. It is to surveillance capitalism what General Motors was to 20th century corporate capitalism and mass production. The crucible and the archetype. So it's fair game for careful study, just as men like Peter Drucker and Al Chandler studied General Motors to understand the nature of 20th century corporate capitalism. Google rose in the world as a champion of the thwarted individual. It was an heroic exemplar of many of the functions that I've just identified with the advocacy model rescuing and distributing valued information directly to individuals. But as pressures for profit mounted, Google discovered that it could revolutionize online advertising using immense outlays of capital and skill by unilaterally appropriating, unilaterally appropriating, datafying, extracting, analyzing, and applying artificial intelligence to data from and about users in order to produce algorithms that predict user behavior. Unlike other internet firms desperately seeking profit in the early 2000s, Google quickly became hugely profitable on the strength of this single discovery, a turning point that clarified for the world that Google's customers are its advertisers. From that point on, the aim was to extend its reach across users' online activities, an aim that now expands 
as Martha alluded to, to the datification of the real time lived realities of users' experience. Ergo, the current focus on cell phones, home environments, self-driving cars, commerce, and so on and so on and so on. Google does have a chief economist, Hal Varian, a respected Berkeley professor of economics, and at Google, he has helped to refine and extend what is now called Googlenomics. But he also writes about his, his insights and what I now understand are uh, working dog articles, for those of you who heard David yesterday. Um, and I spend quite a bit of my time trying to reverse engineer uh, Mr. Varian's insights into Googlenomics. And I'm going to share just a sliver before I close out these remarks. Just enough to suggest that surveillance capitalism harbors some remarkable features and novel institutional facts whose implications extend far beyond the established realm of the private firm. For example, in a recent academic paper on computer-mediated transactions, Varian identifies four major economic advances, innovations, if you will, that computer mediation, he says, makes possible. One of these is what he calls monitoring and contracts. The idea here, regarded as an article of faith in the business and technology communities is that the world is already becoming and soon will be completely saturated with computationally enabled connected sensors. Varian says, I quote, because transactions are now computer mediated, we can observe behavior that was previously unobservable and write contracts on it. He says this enables new kinds of transactions and business models. Varian offers examples. If someone stops making monthly car payments, the lender can, I quote, instruct the vehicular monitoring system not to allow the car to be started and to signal the location where it can be picked up. He goes on to say, insurance companies can rely on similar monitoring systems to check if customers are driving safely and thus determine whether or not to maintain their insurance or pay their claims. I think that what's being described here is not new forms of contract, but rather what I call the uncontract. It transcends the contract form by stripping away any need for contract or the laws that oversee contracts. Varian appears to be aiming for what Oliver Williamson calls a condition of contract utopia, which is also, by the way, called a plan. Varian's vision of the uses of computer mediation empties the contract of uncertainty. It eliminates the need for and therefore the possibility of trust. From the Romans to John Locke to Maine to Arendt to Rawls to Searle, the contract in human affairs is recognized for its centrality in establishing consensual participation in the values from which legitimate authority is derived. The development and expression of free will the social recognition of reciprocal rights and obligations. In the surveillance capitalist future, these are traded for the universal equivalent of the prisoner's ankle bracelet. Another way of saying this is that contracts are reimagined as machine processes, and the social is left to atrophy and die kicked to the side of the road. Human replenishment from the failures and triumphs of asserting predictability in the face of natural and inevitable uncertainty gives way to the blankness of perpetual compliance. In this futurescape, the freedom achieved in the human experience of entering into a contract is annihilated simply because it's inconvenient or 
inefficient. This one example among many that obviously I don't have time to elaborate right now, suggests a market form with so many remarkable and even dangerous ambitions that have so far eluded economics and economists. The emerging logic of accumulation here is one that creates wealth by instrumenting and instrumentalizing, capturing and analyzing, predicting and modifying the behavior of persons and things for the purposes of monetization and control. It relies upon the dependency of users who, as we saw, regard online engagement as necessary for social participation. It creeps on slippered feet largely free from detection or sanction, and in the absence of collectively agreed upon mechanisms to register or withdraw consent. It exploits our lack of defenses. As Google chairperson Eric Schmidt and his co-author Jared Cohn celebrate on the very first page of their book on the digital age, quote, the online world is not truly bound by terrestrial laws. It's the world's largest ungoverned space. I conclude in the place that I began. Will the networked age reaffirm the ontological unity of supply and demand? Will it bring capitalism back to people? Today's thwarted individuals cry out for new facts that assert the primacy of humanity the dignity of the person, the well-being of our planet, and the bonds of democratic community strengthened by individual empowerment and knowledge. New networked market forms can be at least part of the solution to this other crisis of inequality. I do not suggest that we should construct utopias but rather that we can and should draw upon the authentic promise of the digital, the promise that was so much easier to embrace before Ed Snowden entered history. We are only at the beginning of this contest. And I think it's so, so important for us to recognize this fact. The future of this narrative will depend in no small measure on the scholars who are drawn to this frontier project and the citizens, all of us, who act in the knowledge that effectiveness without autonomy is not effective, that dependency-induced compliance is no social contract, and that the freedom from uncertainty is no freedom. Thank you. Well, good morning to all. Um, and my thanks to uh, the New York Review of Books and particularly for, to Simon for bringing me here, for also bringing all of you here. It's great to have you here. Um, putting a tie on on a Sunday morning has given me the feeling of church all over again. I, I shall try not to preach, but there may be something preachy in, in this. Um, I need, as several others have done in the room, to say I am not an economist. Um, I coming, and I, one reason I have used some slides is to insist that I come from this very spurious institution, a school of information. Everyone always asks, what is that? Um, one of the troubles with that is that you tend to end up in a room where most people in the audience know more about what you're talking about than you do, and that might be true again today. Um, but what I want to talk about uh, is information, and as Simon had asked me to do as well, to talk about knowledge. And one of the reasons I feel that this is a useful forum to do that is I worry very much about the seamlessness with which academic economics moves 
from one to the other very efficiently. George Stigler, who has a seminal paper on the topic, opens by saying economists don't have to be told, I think, that information is important, knowledge is power. And that easy equation that what we think of as information, which then takes them to information theory, Claude Shannon developed, which is highly mathematizable, so therefore fits very nicely with models, and you have Ken Arrow talking about the reduction of uncertainty as the definition of information. But Shannon was very, very clear that I information in his theory is independent of meaning. But if we bridge that over then to the world of meaning and knowledge and use the same word, the polysemy can become, to put it very politely, problematic. So one of the things I want to talk to about today, in a way, in, from our title of this panel, is making sense. And I want to say that this enormously important human attribution of sense making in many ways, Shoshana Zhubov was talking about, um, is something that economists tend to bypass. Now, I don't mean by that that economists don't have any sense, but I do want to suggest that the way in which they refer to information allows them to appear, on the one hand, to be talking about human sense-making when they find that useful, but equally to avoid the implications, the social, the cultural, um, uh, implications of knowledge and sense making when that also is unproblematic or is problematic for them and their models. The second point that I want to make, and I'll go fairly quickly through this, so let me just say what's underpinning what may seem particularly incoherent thoughts, is that dealing with people who work in the technology sector, I find them enormously influenced by economistic assumptions of individual utility maximization. And they very much tend, again, to exclude the social and the cultural. Now, they're not building models, they're building machines, and they're building the sort of machines that we just heard about can very much organize our lives. So I have in mind, as I talk about this, both the economistic models, which is a topic of today, but also the technological models that follow from using pretty much the same theory. So, is that going to work? Yes. Okay, so um, now I want to talk a little bit about organizational theory, but again with the idea that this is then transferred not only to the black box of organizations, but the black box of technology. And that one of the challenges that economics and business theory has always faced is what I call making the workplace manageable and behind that, we have a notion of principles and agents. There are the principles that run the firm, and there are the agents or, or that own the business, and the agents who are meant to carry out their instructions. And the strange thing about that formulation, and I want to rem remind us all that Paul Krugman yesterday said, we need to talk less about people, about agents and more about people, and I certainly applaud that notion. But when we start to talk about them as agents, we then develop a notion of deviancy. And that is an idea that the trouble with agents is that they have agency. And they're going to do things that we don't want them to do and follow their own interests. And so the challenge, both with technology of the sort that Halvarian is, is, is describing and with economics, is that in many ways we come to the paradox that we want to make our agents agent-less. So we then look at how we see that configured. And one of the ways in which this has historically been, conf been configured, and part of my argument is that in some ways we're not seeing anything very new, is of course in the notion of, of the division of labor and that idea of the head and the hands, which of course was how in the 19th century you just described the division of labor in factories. You had a head that ran the factory, and as Dickens would have said, you had the hands that did the work. And their job was in many ways to follow, in, well, entirely almost to follow instructions and not to think. And this goes back to someone like Adam Ferguson, Smith's contemporary, and possibly the person who first really thought of the division of mental or intellectual labor. I, I'm a great admirer of him, but unfortunately I think this is a, a revealing quotation of the time. Many mechanical arts require no capacity. They succeed best under total suppression of sentiment and reason. 
the agent is not meant to think or feel. And ignorance is the mother of industry as well as superstition, so manufacturers prosper most when the mind is least constructed. Where the workshop may be considered an engine, the parts of which are men. And I think we still have many of those nations, but now the notion is not that we need to make people act like machines, but we can simply replace people with machines, because that's what we've wanted all along. So we see it in, again, the great father of the computer, uh, George Babbage, one of the great advantages which may derive from machinery is from the check it affords against inattention, idleness, and dishonesty of human agents. And in many ways, those last three are the only capabilities that we acknowledge in the agent. We don't think of them as having any other aspects. Um, so what I want to suggest is that we have come from a world that had a desire for these agentless agents, and we have started to build technology along those systems that assumes agentless angels, and that has various consequences. One of my great heroes in this is Admiral Trowbridge, who was one of Nelson's admirals. He dry, died during the wars, and he had the wonderful line, whenever I see a fellow look as if he was thinking, I call that mutiny. <laughs> and there we have a vision in many ways that is then echoed in the 20th century with William Scott and organization the human behavior disrupts the best laid orga organizational plans. And into all those, we then have notions of bodies versus minds, and that the mind is now a separable entity just with information which we can exchange anywhere around the world. And that's how we get some of these theories. There's one notion of globalization which can say, well, I need bodies in a different country because they're cheaper to do the work that I'm asking them to do. But that's rather different from the sort of techies view, which is the work I do is spaceless and placeless. It's the notion of the death of distance, the annihilation of time and space, which is a wonderful notion. I only wish that the people who believed in that didn't all feel they had to get on a plane and fly to San Francisco to prove that distance doesn't matter anymore. Um, but we live in many ways with that sense. The second part, I think, that comes from this idea is that we want to conduct, construct in many ways a mindless world. I think of this with something like the Google car. Uh, in many ways, what the Google car wants and probably will get is a world in which there are only other Google cars because then the predictability of motion is absolutely perfect. Once you put these wretched other people and bicycles out on the road, the Google car actually has some trouble with that. So what we are constructing then is a world to meet these both desires and assumptions about the principal agent, the mind, the body exchanges. Um, so let me then, if I may, go back to an example that I used a long time ago, but in the nature of some of the discussion today, I thought I, I, I would use it again. It was by a colleague of mine, um, and it's about customer service. And one reason I want to do that, is, well, one is actually that I, I, we all know that customer service, which is often both the interface between people and organizations and between people and machines that are malfunctioning. And I think we all know it's a highly, highly problematic system. It is one for a long time people have assumed would be easy to organize. I go back to this one of, of machine technicians because there was an article in 2013 by Frey and Osborne called The Future of Work. And they tried to predict what professions would not be raised by technology, and in fact, customer service was the second on their list as one of the most resistant, and it's interesting to think of why. This was work that was done by, a, uh, I'm describing by a colleague of mine when we both worked for the Xerox Research Center, about technicians repairing Xerox machines. And as the machines got more complicated, in a way, the, the trust in the agents was such that they were expected to think less. They were given a manual, which would respond to error codes from the machine. They would follow steps and repair the machine, and then the job would be over. So you have, again, a case of almost agentless agents. What Julian discovered as he ethnographically followed these people around was that actually, if you could predict the problems with machines, you would build machines that wouldn't have those problems. So inevitably, the problems that turned up were unpredictable. So these people sat there with manuals which didn't respond to what the machine was doing. At which point, the final instruction is replace the machine. <laughs> now, replacing the machine has several problems. One is it's enormously expensive for the corporation. 
And two, it's highly destructive for the corporation's reputation, which in some ways these technicians were invested in and their own reputation. So what Julian found was that they were incredibly good at coming up with ways of fixing these unforeseen problems. And although they were assumed to work individually by the company and to be the ideal sole agents that you send out with instructions, in fact, what they did was they met for breakfast, they met for lunch, they met for drinks after work, and they exchanged ideas, they discussed machines, and they generated their sense making in an entirely different way from the engineers, but that kept these machines working. And what was remarkable about that was in many ways, in the context of what I'm talking about, if you want your agents to be the ideal rule followers, they were breaking the rules. But in doing that, they were saving the corporation from itself. Had they followed the rules, they would have precipitated an enormous amount of bad faith towards it and its technology. So we have this problem that we have an ideal about agents and agents, uh, uh, principles and agents, is that the agent's role is to follow the principles rules, but in fact that's not necessarily in the principal's interest. And I think that part of what comes out of it too though is A, that breaking rules is important, acknowledging sense-making abilities and knowledge, but the other thing is that our nature of the understanding of this relationship is that when anybody asked the technicians what they did, and I think back here to what Richard Sennett was saying this morning about it's those strange things in surveys that catch your mind they would always describe their work in terms of what the corporation expected them to do because that's how you got promotion and that's how you stayed out of trouble. Which meant that the knowledge that they were generating, which was of enormous value to the corporation about the problem of these machines, would not get back to the corporation. So the idea that all they're involved in is an information exchange is very easily imagined as a model, but highly problematic when we un understand work. Let me just very quickly, I think I'd like to give another brief example that followed later from this. Again, a case of mechanization. It used to be that the technicians would go in in the morning to a call center, which was part of how they knew one another, although they were this sort of isolated role. Um, and they would pick up a paper account of the day's work and go out and do the work. Now, that's an obvious thing to automate. So first with telephones, then with faxes, and finally with emails. The idea was that you would sit up, wake up in the morning and your phone would, or your fax would tell you what to do for the day and you would go out and do the work. Wonderful time and labor-saving operation. Except that Xerox began to notice that costs were going up. And they couldn't fathom this, but again, they had the wisdom to find a, an anthropologist to go out and look at the ch some of the changing call centers. And what he found was that, of course, if people all went in in the morning to pick up their work orders, they'd be standing around and have a cup of coffee and say, oh, not that machine again. You know what the problem with that machine is? You just have to kick it, you know, or if you restart the paper feed. And not only did that help the technicians spread their awareness of the machines, but those people who were assumed to be particularly dumb, the people answering the phones, would hear this. And when the phone call came in next, they would say, have you thought of, and the, generated, the knowledge that was generated and collectively understood by these people was now again in the service of the corporation, but entirely invisible to them, so much so that they broke up all these relationships, which to them were important. So my point there is that, what we think of as highly effective and efficient rulemaking to deal with, for instance, information, is actually occluding a great deal of knowledge making, which is particularly important as we develop these machines. Um, but as I say in my critique here is that when we look at economics, it doesn't always, sorry, at my point they're losing sense, that they have a very different view. I mean, this is Herb Simon, one of the Nobel Pri Prize winners, an extraordinary quotation where he says, all aspects of knowledge, creation, storage, retrieval, treatment as property, role in the functioning of societies can be and has been analyzed with the tools of economics. It has a price, a cost of production, there are markets for knowledge, supply and demand curves. Now that just strikes me, for any of us who have any epistemological grounding, is extraordinarily strange. In some ways, you can see how it's influenced by theories of information in economics. And I'm a great admirer of the economist, again, another Nobel Prize winner, George Akerlof. And he comes up with this idea that markets collapse when there is information asymmetry. 
It's a very powerful notion, I find, until you start to think, but what on earth do we mean by information symmetry? That is, what is this stuff, even if we're not talking about knowledge, that I can simply pass from A to B and now B is in exactly the same mental state as A is and therefore everything can be understood by both. Um, equally, the notion that it has a price is problematic for me because again, when we look at economics, uh, Hayek has this wonderful account that information is the condition by which markets work. And in a way, Akerlof is saying the same. We need price information in order to coordinate our behavior. Well, that's fine as long as we think of information only as a condition of markets. Once we start to think, as we do more and more now, as information as the content of markets, it's highly problematic because it can't both be the shared, readily accessible precondition and also the problematic exchangeable price variable. Attempt. So I want to suggest that we have um, very tricky issues here, and they turn in some way around what I think of as the way in which we construct knowledge. And let me here very briefly talk about a conference in Berkeley, the Berkeley Knowledge Conference, where there were two, everybody came together with this great idea that we are going to move from information to knowledge, but there were two views of it. And one is that information, that knowledge is like information and just moves wherever you want it to go. And the other is the Lou Platt phrase, which is, he said of Hewlett Packard, if only Hewlett Packard knew what Hewlett Packard knows. And that is the idea we have all this knowledge, but we can't get it to move. So you have two entirely different views of knowledge. And one of the assumptions then is, well, what comes up, what we need are the conditions for that knowledge to move. And that has always philosophically been given the notion, the name of tacit knowledge. And we have this distinct, now economics will then tell us, well, we can readily transform tacit knowledge into explicit knowledge. Um, but I think that that's a huge assumption which is highly problematic because in many ways tacit knowledge gives us the conditions, the socially generated sense-making conditions whereby we can understand the explicit. Therefore, if you turn it into explicit, you're going to need another body of tacit knowledge to understand it. It's that way in which we can understand a joke and laugh or have the joke <laughs> explained to us which tends not to make us laugh. Um, the wonderful account of George Moore reading Principia Ethica, and he wrote to Bertrand Russell, and he said, I understood every word and not one of the sentences. Um, and, and I actually think in the discussions we've had here, if we try to understand the battles between the saltwater and freshwater economists, they can share the same facts, but it doesn't seem to change their minds because they have two very different constructions of what explicit knowledge is. So we get uh, very quickly, Aristotle says, you know, thinking of this, it's easy to know what honey and wine and cautery do. Um, what is tricky, though, is to know how, when, and whom, and where these should be used. And for that, you have to be a doctor. Um, or Michael Oakeshott's wonderful line, if you ask me the circumstances in which patients' accuracy and economy dawned upon me, they came from an instructor, not on the account of anything he said, but because he was a man of patient accuracy, economy, elegance, and style. And those are the things we pick up which we cannot make explicit. And I think then we face these very strange problem, problems of how we cultivate those things, particularly if we don't think of them as important. <coughs> One of the things that gives me most concern, of course, is the people who are developing these, the technology that we're going to deal with tend to feel that this stuff is unimportant. And we had Shelley quoted, yes, and we had Keats quoted yesterday, and so I want to quote today Shelley with a phrase that gives me great fear today, and that is he talked of poets then of being the unacknowledged legislators of mankind. And I think today the unacknowledged legislators are our techies. And one thing I'm concerned about is if they only have a faith in explicit knowledge, where are they themselves getting their sense of what should be done? And as a final story, let me tell you, I went to a huge celebration in Silicon Valley of young technologists, and they were talking about machine learning, which we've talked about here, and they were saying how you could now have MOOCs of 200,000 people, and that what you could do in those huge courses was you could machine grade the problem sets. And so I asked them, what will happen to those subjects that cannot be graded by machine? And the answer I was given, we won't need those subjects anymore. <laughs>
And as we look at these people now as the principles that are hoping, as Shona said, to drive us as the agents, we should worry about that. Thank you very much. I want to focus on what I call the humanist side of economics. I want this to be a brief um, account of the role of humanism in economics. And that leads me directly to the discussion of dignity, um, which we had this morning, which Jeremy talked about. Because questions of dignity seems to me, seem to me to arise in an acute form when we look at the role of information technology in the workplace. I think there are two concepts of dignity which are relevant here. I'm following Isaiah Berlin, two, conce two concepts of liberty, two concepts of dignity. There is basic, what I'd call basic dignity, and Jeremy was talking about that. The throwing of dwarfs is uh, an aggression against the basic dignity of humans, and it absolutely should not happen. It's in the same category as the rounding up of the Jewish population of, of Polish towns by the SS. Or, to get nearer to economies, it's what Marx described in Book Two of Das Kapital in the textile mills of high Victorian England when the mill owners were running the machines flat out, and he was wearing them out, of course. But he was wearing out the human labor which uh, attended the machines. And when they were worn out, they were thrown on the scrap heap and new labor was hired. That is an affront to human dignity. And we should not think that that kind of economics of the human scrap heap is confined to the 19th century, because if you look at the work practices of the Amazon Fulfillment Center, then you see the economics of the human scrap heap in the 21st century. Bezos is working his workers flat out governed by information systems until they wear out, uh, they're fired and they're replaced by a new lot of workers. So dignity in, in the basic sense has a relevance to the contemporary economy. But there is also a second sense of dignity, which is what I'll call positive dignity, and that was referred to uh, by Professor Phelps, and that is the right of people through the workplace to fulfill themselves, to be creative, to develop their talents. And that too is, to my mind, an absolute moral obligation to which economics must defer. So we must judge information systems and how they operate in the workplace by the extent to which they accommodate uh, the second positive sense of dignity. Now, if we look at the role of information technology systems in society, there are three obvious dimensions on us. their impact on us as citizens, uh, as consumers, and as employees. Citizens, the issues are raised acutely by the Snowden case, the use of uh, the power of information technology to snoop on a massive scale. Consumers, the ability of Google to acquire panoptic information about us and to use it without our wanting it or knowing. And thirdly, the use of information systems in the workplace to define the nature of work. And I'm going to talk about that. There isn't time to talk about the other two. And again, if we're looking at the role of information systems in the, in, in the workplace, I want to make another tripartite distinction. There's manufacturing. There is what I call industrialized services, which economists call services, but they're really not. They're industrial companies. Walmart and Amazon, as far as the workforce is concerned, are industrial companies. The workforce at the Amazon Fulfillment Center, as I've already said, are subject to rigorous and draconian industrial discipline. This isn't really a service uh, sector at all. And thirdly, there is a, a section which I call core, core services, and this is critical to looking at the role of information systems. And these are services where, that, where there are very complex interactions between human agents. I'm talking about higher education, uh, schools, healthcare, so-called human resource management, public administration, welfare institutions, 
customer relations management, which Paul talked about, and financial services. This is a gigantic chunk of the contemporary economy uh, where information systems have an enormous role. But what role? That is the question. Now, I need to define what I mean by information systems because one cannot take that for granted and economists tend to do that. They tend to say, well, we all know what information systems are, let, let's start talking about them. I contest that. For example, I contest the idea that we focus on individual artifacts of technology of standalone systems, robots, uh, or com actually computers themselves, as early attempts by economists tried to do. What I want to talk about are extremely complex systems of technology which bring together ho a whole lot of different technologies. They bring together where, uh, data systems, data warehouses, data marts, so-called, uh, workflow systems, targeting systems, monitoring systems, and so-called expert systems, which try and substitute automated expert systems for us in these complex core services involving complex transactions between, hu between human agents. Now, there are various criteria, it seems to me, according to which one judges the operation of these systems in relation to the dignity of employees, and I'm talking about axes because the thesis I, uh, I'm most in disagreement with is the thesis by economists like Brynjolfsson that there is a high degree of technological determinism, which really means effectively that the way corporations use technology is the way it has to be because it's technologically determined by the nature of technologies as objects of science. I contest that. In fact, there are axes of use, uh, and the nature of the use can vary along the different axes. And there are three, in my view. The first is the extent to which these systems monitor and control and target and survey the workforce. There's a continuum of use. How severe is the monitoring regime which these systems impose, number one? Number two, to, to what extent do the expert systems embodied in these systems try and replace our own judgment and expertise in the exercise of skill in these areas of what I call core services, higher education, human resource management, customer relations management, etc. To what extent do the systems try and displace our own knowledge and judgment with computerized systems? That is the second axis of evaluation. The third is one which people often overlook, and that is you, have, you can have a situation where the system does not explicitly try and replace our judgment by computer systems, but it actually de facto does because the monitoring regime is so severe that employees don't actually have the time to exercise their judgment. And there's, there's a <coughs> disgraceful example of that in the UK, which is a hospital I in the county of Staffordshire, where the regime of industrial medicine was so severe that the nurses were dehumanized and a thousand people lost their lives simply because the nurses uh, and the doctors, they just didn't have the sort of mental space to look at them. In other words, their expertise was crushed by the uh, demands of the timing and monitoring system. So here we have the three axes of evaluation, and as I say, they are a continuum, because you can imagine different kinds of regimes on each of the axes. Now, what I want to argue now is that in American business culture, there is an extreme bias towards what I call an industrial use of these systems. And that's something that economists simply haven't taken on board. And, and that's why I think that most of the work they've done in this area is of very dubious value. History is absolutely crucial in understanding the biases. And there are two, it, it, seem, it seems to me, enormously powerful historic biases coming down from American history in the last 100 years. The first is the bias that comes down from the industrial tradition of Henry Ford, 
and Frederick Winslow Taylor. The Ford plant was a miracle of industrial efficiency and integration for its time. The processes, and process is the key word in this whole area of information systems, the processes were ca carefully worked out. They included everything from the steel mill to the final testing station. Everything was timed under a regime of process. But also integrated within the Ford system was the practice of scientific management coming out of Taylor. And the essence of scientific management is that the planning of work and the performance of the work are separate. The planning of the work is done by experts who have superior knowledge, and the work is done by the chaps on the assembly line. This is the es essence of scientific management. And of course, it was an extremely dynamic system. My, arg my first argument about history is that the Ford-Taylor model has been e extraordinarily successful and resilient in American business history. It, it was driving the industrialization of the 20s, which ended in the Great Crash. It effectively won us the Second World War because we swint, simply swamped the Germans just by volume of production. We had the application of the mass production system to the civilian economy after the Second World War. And then we had a, a critical development, which people uh, overlook, which is the uh, renewal of Ford Taylor's system by the Japanese in the 70s and 80s. They simply tightened it up. It was getting in poor repair in the United States. The Japanese came, up, came and they tightened it up. And then you have the absolutely critical stage, which is the advent of business process re-engineering, uh, hammer and champy, in the 1980s. And what that means is the uh, transfer of the whole Ford-Taylor system refined by the Japanese to the service economy and to the frontline processes of the service economy, to the frontline processes of human resource management, customer relations management, processing people through uh, healthcare systems, and so on, which it seems to me is deeply dysfunctional. And, and issues of dignity arise here uh, all the way along the line, that um, the way people are treated by managed care companies, the way they're processed through clinics and hospitals, is an affront to human dignity, which is why there is a crisis in American healthcare. That is the first great historical current coming down uh, from American history. But there's a second one. And I wrote a whole book on this uh, 10 years ago without being aware of this second current. But the second current is absolutely critical to an understanding of the role of these systems. And it's the one that Philip Murawski has written about brilliantly. And it's the current that comes down from the military. If you look at the origins of these control systems which are heavily computerized, you have to look at the military. You have to look at the control systems which came out of the Cold War, and particularly the control systems for the defense of the United States against air attack from the Soviet Union, the SAGE system, which was the most sophisticated of a whole lot of control systems coming out of uh, the Cold War and the nuclear terror. And of course, the uh, SAGE system was a military system. Uh, it, it, it integrated computers into a continent-wide system of air defense and the marshalling of vast quantities of information in real time under uh, apocalyptic conditions, i.e. the Soviet bombers uh, coming t towards Washington. And because they were military systems uh, created in apocalyptic context, they were extremely authoritarian, extremely centralized. And one of the cru crucial events of American business history came in the early 60s when the whole technology of SAGE, the air defense system, was transferred to the civilian sector with a system called SABRE. And SABRE was the automated reservation system for American airlines. And that is the generation of panoptic systems of corporate control. Uh, and you have the fusion of the Ford-Taylor system, which really deals mostly with frontline business processes and the systems coming out of the military, which deal with the whole corporate structure, the whole uh, structure from higher management to the front line. And I think I'll end by saying that there is an absolutely fundamental uh, social economic consequence of that, which is this. 
that with the coming of the panoptic systems under a management system called the balanced scorecard, what is happening is that the regimes of industrial discipline and control, which we think of as being applied to frontline workers under the Taylor system, are applied to everybody. We're all part of it. If we belong to organizations, whether it's universities or healthcare systems, we are now all subject to pan panoptic surveillance and control by these systems disposed of by senior management. And that has a very profound political consequences because we have to ask ourselves the question, why has the response of the civic society been so weak to the, these developments of really a kind of brutal form of capitalism, which I think are comparable to what Marx described in the 19th century. And there is a reason for this, it, which is that we're all part of it. In the 19th century, the great reformers, the churchmen, the Quakers, the, the Methodists, of which Hillary Clinton was one, were not part of the factory system. They knew about the factory system, and they were well informed about it and they criticized it and they reformed it. They were not part of it. But today, vast segments of the middle class are part of the system. And it seems to me the system is exhausting and draining people by its demands and its surveillance. So they don't have the time or the psychological space to fight it. And I think that is a profound cr crisis of society. And it's difficult to see how the onward march of these systems is going to be halted. And let me just say, do I have a few minutes? There are alternatives to this, uh, and it's important that we have uh, a Scandinavian presence here, because if you want to look at alternative ways of using these systems, they exist particularly in Scandinavia. Uh, many of the ideas originated at Xerox Park when Paul was there, and there was a strong correspondence between Scandinavia and Xerox Park. And you build alternative systems by allowing employees at all level to shape the systems. You fight the tyranny of the system designers and the scientific managers who want to subordinate human dignity on the altar of efficiency and productivity. And I think the Scandinavian uh, example shows that this can be done. And if we, if we want to have an intellectual comeback to this, I think that's the way we do it. Thanks. Questions. Who, uh, who is our mic bearer? Long way back. I, I think it's more important to hear okay. to hear what everyone else is thinking. We've talked enough. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. This is fascinating conversation. I'd like to go back to Professor Zuboff's, you know, the, the surveillance capitalism, and you mentioned advocacy capitalism and it is a kind of lighter version. Um, but in terms of on, on the surveillance capitalism is we're figuring out as consumers how do we go up against this kind of passive use of our monetization of our data. There's been some folks that have said, uh, you know, maybe micro transactions that we get paid for our data. Something else I found very interesting was a week or so ago in an unrelated tech article, it said that now on one of the cell phone companies, you can actually pay, you have to pay a fee not to be monitored. It's not just a passive act. So is there, are there going to be people like the Quakers who can stand outside of the system in the 19th century? Are there going to be people that have opted out of the observation, this sort of being as a consumer, opt, opt, as being part of this on the other side, of, as a pushback to this kind of creep? Okay, well, um, there's sort of the short term and, and the long term. Uh, uh, um, I'm very fond of uh, John Searle's work and the idea of the, the declaration, you know. The way we take over, the way we create institutional facts is essentially to make declarations. A declaration is a statement 
that states the nature of reality as if it already existed. <laughs> so uh, companies like Google have declared this is the, your data they have declared as what they call digital exhaust. So in making that declaration, they've defined it as waste material. Who would complain about somebody using digital exhaust effectively? To, right? So I, I bring this up because I think in the, we have short-term and long-term issues. In the short term, we have opportunities for counter declarations. That's my term, not Searle's. Counter declarations are things like lawsuits. <laughs> um, you know, we can sue Google and Facebook, um, and what, 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 have, what have come out of these suits are very narrow changes in their practice that don't change the foundations of their legitimacy as surveillance capitalists. So it's a counter declaration that has an important role to play as a stopgap. We can, um, um, what's it called? Um, you know, words. No, no, we can, um, you know, uh, encrypt, sorry, <laughs> encrypt our, our data, our communications, right? That's a countermeasure. So that might protect me, but it leaves the rest of you unprotected, right? So there are many, many countermeasures. We have to get super creative about these countermeasures, and we need as many of them as possible. However, they're not the ultimate answer. The ultimate answer is what I call a synthetic declaration. You'll notice the uh, uh, dialectical logic here. We need a synthetic declaration that actually contests the legitimacy and inevitability of these practices. And whilst, um, whilst it, you know, at various moments, Paul and Simon have showed glimmers of optimism and, and glimmers of, um, of subjugation to the thought of inevitability, um, I refuse to believe that these matters are inevitable. These are firms. firms live and die. These are market forms. Market forms have beginning and middles and ends. These are not, you know, it's not, this is not global warming, which is really hard to figure out, or, you know, climate crisis, climate disorientation. These are human actions. We can reverse that. The key thing about synthetic declarations, last thing I'll say, sorry if I'm going on a little too long, but just to throw this out, because it is an optimistic note. Um, it always, it always helps to read the opposition very carefully. And uh, so I read Milton Friedman very carefully. And one of the canny, canny things that he, he said was that the um, court decisions, and in general, public policy, follows public opinion by 20 years. So his strategy, which was brilliant, you know, back in the, uh, back in the 70s and, and 60s when he was still on the fringe and, you know, considered sort of a weirdo in economics, um, uh, his strategy was to focus on education and, you know, writing textbooks and writing books and getting modules into, into high school and even elementary education and doing those television shows that communicated, you know, to the public. That was his focus because he had his eye on 20 years hence. And he was absolutely right, because 20 years hence, the courts and policies are entirely captured by his paradigm. All right, so synthetic declaration, that's our long-term goal. In the meantime, we band together to put up every kind of fight we can. Uh, boy, this was a very different panel from yesterday. Um, thank you. I'm just curious. Uh, uh, my sense is that since the collapse of Lehman Brothers, um, there has been an explosion in algorithmic decision making, which is a little <laughs> surreal. Um, do you think that the fetish with algorithmic decision making has made corporate decision making better? I guess that's the first question. And then I guess my other comment is that given the fact that the oil and gas industry relies most um, relies very much on uh, corporate modeling. Uh, 
Um, do you think they missed something by being so focused on explicit rather than tacit information, um, given the collapse of oil prices and how that screwed up their business plans? <laughs> I think it's your turn, Paul. Okay, all right. Um, I, I did, if, if, if I may, I, 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 I get to that. Uh, one, I, just to, to follow up on what you sort of said about uh, synthesis and dealing with the future. Being an expat, I, I have this odd feeling that um, the strange thing about the Brits and the Europeans mm -hmm. in general is that they are very, very concerned about corporate behavior and remarkably complacent about government behavior. And you come over here, and people tend to be remarkably complacent about corporate behavior. That's good, and it's efficient, and very worried about government behavior. I think that with the revelations about GCHQ in England that has start to change over there, and we're now getting more of a synthesis, because on both sides, it, because the trouble is we've seen a synthesis between corporations and governments as the NSA moved into AT&T in San Francisco and started tapping internet wires. So we need also a similar synthesis in our resistance rather than a trust in one and a suspicion of the other. They're, they're both problematic in our synthesis. So sorry to that. Um, to the explosion of algorithmic behavior, I, I think it's absolutely true. Um, uh, remarkable things. I mean, I have students working, for instance, on something which we all know and believe is put together by hundreds of earnest individuals working hard, and that's Wikipedia, which is almost dominated by algorithms nowadays, and it's controlled and organized and, and, and regimented by them. So they're turning up everywhere. I think, in a way, it was, you know, as I think it was sort of what I was trying to say, the tricky thing is to answer the question of, is it better? I think what we do is we start to define good in terms of what the algorithms could do, and therefore we can ine inevitably end up by saying, yeah, of course they're better because they meet those goals. But in that way, we're shifting. The, 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 and again, briefly, the, the tacit, uh, explicit decision, um, I think that one of the odd things about the market collapse, but market behavior in general, is how much of it, in fact, the core work turns on shared tacit understandings that are not evident to the people who only get the explicit accounts. So um, Goldman's belief that it was perfectly permissible to betray your own clients if it served your interests was clearly shared among people at Goldman, but they didn't tell the clients that when they were selling them duff goods. Mm -hmm. So I think that, uh, and in some ways, part of what I'm saying is that the tacit isn't something that you can necessarily just tell. It doesn't just become explicit, so that these were understandings that maybe even Goldman themselves would never have framed in those terms. So I think there was a, for me, that I would defer, define some of those problems in tacit, explicit distinctions, but, but that's how I do it. Thank you for a very, very interesting panel. And I have a question sort of inspired by one of Professor Zuboff's comments about um, the fact that these corporate forms cannot live forever. And I'd like to hear more about the role of the corporation in all of this, because in fact, my understanding is that the, the way, and you would certainly know better than I would, but I thought that the corporate form was designed precisely to be able to live forever in a way that human beings could not. Um, and so I would, just, I would just love to hear more about how the corporation factors into this. Um, it's been a really wonderful conference, but I've been surprised not to hear more about, about the corporate form. So from, from any of the panelists. Uh, well, you know, the, the corporate form, um, uh, there's a, a lot of uh, really wonderful research on this. And um, if I open up my laptop, I could quote you all the, all the figures. But, um, you know, the corporate form is in retreat. So if we look at um, the, just simply the number of um, public companies that existed uh, mid-century compared to now, um, I forget exactly what the, the number is, but it's, it's down by almost half. And the... Um, the number of people employed by public corporations is also a fraction of what it was, say, in the late 1970s, as recently as that. Um, 
you know, just contrast something like a Google and a, and a General Motors, which I, which I began to do before, but there are other very interesting contrasts, you know. Google employs about, I think it's now like 48,000 people. And when General Motors was um, at the peak of its powers, it, it employed about a million and a half people around the world. So um, the, the, the number of public corporations is way down. The number of people they employed is shrinking. And uh, what's happened is that um, uh, the, the corporation has been essentially disaggregated, right? So there are you know, manufacturing operations and marketing operations and distribution operations. And in many instances, these are no longer united in, in, a, in a single public company. These may be um, uh, private companies that, that are operating um, or or have other ownership forms. Um, so um, what's happened in this period of, of the, the, the domin dominance of the neoliberal paradigm, value maxim shareholder value maximization and so on, is that that has actually damaged the public corporation, which was an animal that was far more embedded, back to my idea of ontological unity, far more embedded in society for all the complaints we have about Henry Ford and so on and so forth. Those were market forms that were dependent upon their populations as sources of employees and as sources of customers. So losing that embeddedness, um, we have lost uh, a, a critical feature um, in, this, in this new modern capitalistic market form that is, um, that is oriented toward value maximization. Google is the archetype of that. It is no longer dependent on its populations as a source of employees or as a source of customers. And if you think about that critically, that really lifts Google and this whole new kind of corporate ethos out of the history of market democracies and out of the history of democracy itself. Because democracy, as we know, when elites gave way and, 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 and enlarged the franchise to populations, it was because they felt they had to, Britain being the, the most you know, perfect case of this, I think, because they had to because without those populations as workers and as consumers, um, those elites couldn't maintain their fortunes. So we're into a whole new political zone, and I'm just going to um, end by saying political to this um, other gentleman. Um, part of the synthetic declaration we must keep in mind is the political. Ultimately, we, what we're discussing here is politics in the deep, good sense of the word, not the corrupted sense. In the way Hannah Arendt uses the word politics, of the polis that it belongs to us, this is this is this is ours to fix. Can I say something? Yeah, I would simply say that when you're looking at the operation of these panoptic panoptic systems, they straddle the public and the private sector. Some of the most alarming examples of their misuse comes from the UK. If you look at the way they're used uh, to wreck, in my view, higher education in the UK. If you look at the absolutely devastating effect they've had in the UK health service. Um, you see that uh, they're, they're uh, used on a gigantic scale to create this kind of panoptic um, surveillance of entire organizations from top to the bottom. And there are still you know, very significant corporations where these systems work. Wal Walmart and Amazon, which, which epitomize a whole um, s segment uh, uh, of the US economy, this, this area between core manufacturing and core services. You have these industrialized services. And, and so there are still tens of millions of people who are subject to these, uh, in my view, profoundly dystopic systems. Just in terms of the question of longevity, um, in this area, just as a footnote, I think one of the areas of concern is to look at intellectual property, which of course is again part of our informational understanding. As Larry Lesk has pointed out, the, the copyright law is just constantly being extended the amount of time it draws, so that in fact it almost is now eternal. Uh, there have been very interesting and worrying moves, I think, as people try to move patents, which of course are meant to expire within 14 years or so, people trying to get them re-evaluated as trademarks, 
because trademarks, again, have an eternal life, and therefore you will own this stuff much longer. Uh, equally, trade secrets as a form of something that you can indefinitely, like the, 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 the Coca-Cola uh, um, sign that you can just keep indefinitely here. Let, let me just invoke, he's mentioned once already, uh, Eric Schmidt, who made the remarkable comment, if there are things on the internet that you don't want people to know about, you probably shouldn't be doing them. Now, if you apply that to Google's trade secrets or Google's <laughs> amassed information and say, well, you don't want that on the net, does that mean that you shouldn't be doing it? Yeah, the answer is yes, but I don't think he'd give that answer, unfortunately. Um, shall we take two questions as our last two questions, and then we will break for lunch. I did an article about corporate spying. It was called 1984, not, not surprisingly. And I was looking at the history of corporations spying on their employees. And I found a professor at the University of Utah who had spent his whole career evaluating how AT&T spied on its employees. And he found that, uh, very brief, I'll try to make it briefly, that when a new boss would come in, if the corporation currently was spying, he would say, this hasn't done a thing. We have to get rid of this. This is not good. And there would be, while during his tenure, there would be no corporate spying. And then when he was replaced, which usually happened in six or seven years, in those days you had longer job security, he would, the, the new guy would say, we have to look at what these people are doing and if they are working most efficiently and so we are going to spy. And so this was the pattern that went on. When they spied though, it became, at first it was quite effective, but it became ineffective with time because the employees would figure out ways to circumvent the surveillance. So for instance, if they were counting in an insurance company how many, how ma whether the people were typing all the time, they would just sit there and go like this while they talked with their Aunt Sally on the phone. And similarly, they had other devices when it came to the lengths of telephone call inquiries in AT&T. Um, my, my point, my question is, are we going to be able to defy the surveillance system currently in place, because it, it, there, it's not that different. Um, I think that's a good question to close on. Okay. Uh, well, sorry, oh, just, oh. Uh, just, just quickly, I, I, what it, it reminds me of, and does it sometimes give me hope, whether it's a spurious hope, and something I don't think we've had mentioned yet, is Goodhart's law. Goodhart was the governor of the Bank of England during the, sorry? Advisor to the Bank of England, sorry, my apologies. Uh, he was a senior figure in the Bank of England in the 1980s, and he observed uh, that as he looked at economic data at the time, that he, his claim was that any statistical regularity when used for purposes of control break down. And it's exactly because people hit the keyboard. Once they realize, now, whether we can implement that today, I mean, I remember in the miners' strike in England in those days, because we knew that GCHQ was listening to all the phone lines, you would pick up the phone and say, bomb, outrage, explosion, gun, fire, and would therefore set all the wheels spinning, you hoped, in GCHQ, mm -hmm. and flood them with data. Whether that worked or not, I don't know. But I think that actually, as I look at data scientists and their confidence about the future that they can predict from the data they gather, I always feel that they're unaware of the problems that Goodhart's law acquires for their certainties of these patents extending into the future. I just say that it becomes much more difficult to evade spying systems when uh, work is done on, uh, on computers on, online because management can actually gaze into your computer screen and see what you're doing. I love, I love the question that you raise and the way that you posed it. Um, and I think it brings us to a deeper problem. And I'm not going to explicate that problem, but I'm only going to identify it. Um, when I wrote my first book, In the Age of the Smart Machine, The Future of Work and Power, in the 80s, um, eight different workplaces, everything from executives down to factory workers, 
understanding computerization. This was a lot of what I, I wrote about. I, I developed the notion of the information panopticon, and, um, and I wrote as much about the way managers used the computer systems to know everything <laughs> as I wrote about the myriad ways in which people learn to game and evade that system, which is, you know, absolutely fascinating. And so the resistance and the control were a dance together inside that panopticon. And the other thing about the panopticon is um, you can leave it. <laughs> now, fast forward to 2015. I am persuaded that um, the language of the panopticon is no longer the appropriate language. The language of spying is no longer the appropriate language. Um, one of my major goals in my, in my new work, which is a, is a new book called Master or Slave, not yet completed, slated to come out in 2016. Um, but one of my major goals there is, is to theorize what this new form of power is and how it is different. And it's only by carefully understanding the, the new syndrome of power that we can begin to imagine what are the forms of inoculation, what are the forms of vaccination, what are the forms of resistance, what are the forms of synthetic declaration that are required. So I thank you for that. I think it's a marker in time. We're quickly moving out of that terrain. And that's the next conference. Great note. Thank you very much for, for listening and for, for your questions.